Being Black in America comes with its challenges. However, we understand that enlightenment through education is the oppressor's worst fear. By bridging the gap between academia and the people, our purpose is to equip you with knowledge that breaks down barriers during your journey towards truth and freedom. Welcome to the Black and Highly Dangerous Podcast. Yeah, Dev, what's going on? What's going on? Nothing much. Just, you know, celebrating this new year of life, moving forward. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm, that's all mm-hmm. that's going on over here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, week two of 2020. <laughs> week two of 2020. <laughs> uh, yes, cannot try. believe it. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, but, you know, it's, I think 2020 is going to be a good year for, for everyone and, and BHD. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Lots of things on the horizons for us personally, but also in this podcasting space. For sure, for sure, for sure. Like we said, we'll have some some big some announcements coming up in the weeks to come about things we're looking to do and and stuff we're working on. Um, So y'all stay tuned for that. Uh, And like, you know, we've already said this last episode, this episode, you know, we're we're talking about major topics and then uh, we're kind of missing out on the current events because it's the holiday season. But we'll get we'll start getting back to that next week, talking about things that's been going on in pop culture, et cetera, that we haven't really Mm -hmm. got a chance to cover yet because, like we said, it's the holiday season. We know everybody's traveling, hanging out and all that good stuff. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So today's focus, um, which, you know, we talk about a lot of like major issues, but one that we haven't really talked about is climate change. Uh, I know it definitely was not in my wheelhouse before I prepared for this episode, but, you know, I feel like I learned a lot. And I think this is a really cool topic, which Ty actually suggested, um, because, I feel like we all should be a part of a conversation on climate change. Yeah, yeah. One of the reasons um, I wanted to address this is because we are hearing a lot about this everywhere, one. Um, But also it's a topic that we've heard a lot about on the debate stage. Um, And I felt like, you know what, let's take some time to look into this a little bit, you know, give some general knowledge by by no means are we experts, but we did want to just try to provide some information about, you know, what's going on with climate change and even more specifically how and if it affects communities of color, because I think that's important to know as we hear these politicians on the debate stage, as we hear these proposals, I think as black folks, we got to know like, uh, okay, how will this affect us? How will this affect our families? How this will affect our communities? And that is, I think, a large part that's missing from a lot of the conversations when we talk about climate change. We do know what's going to happen globally. We know how it can affect a lot of things and the animals and all that stuff, but we need to know how it's going to affect black folk. (laughs) Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Agreed, agreed. Um, and I mean, just to start, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are just like, what is climate? Like, you hear it, and you kind of know, because you know what climate is, and you know what change is, and, you know, we often talk about, like, global warming in relation to client cha- climate change. Um, but, you know, we kind of just want to start, like, what what is it, and why is it happening? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, I think... Um, uh, One thing that I was looking at, too, and I don't know if you found this while you were doing some of your research, Daph, is that people were saying there's like a difference between um, we should say there's like, I guess, technical differences. Even when I was looking at the NASA website between um, climate change and global warming, I think I think they they categorize Mm -hmm. as like two different things. Um, And I think the climate change has more so to do with the weather. Right. Of like mm-hmm. these crazy hurricanes we've been seeing and all this kind of, you know, being cold or, this, you know, the most hot months and all this other kind of stuff versus like global warming. Global warming is really about the earth heating up. And I think climate change is a lot about how it's affecting like a lot of the ecosystem and the weather and stuff like that, which I, mm-hmm. I didn't really know before either, because everybody I think we all use it interchangeably. But I think uh, technically, I think there's a difference between what the experts use. And you know what? That's what I was noticing, too, because a lot of the resources that I initially looked up, it uses it interchangeably or like they're like in the same title. You know, the processes are like related in the terms of like the earth is warming up because of so another term that is often used in this discussion is like global greenhouse gas emissions. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And one thing I found this like cool, like graphic that talked about how, you know, the so with global greenhouse gases, um, they stay in the atmosphere like those greenhouse gases. They come from like emissions. They come from, you know, electricity, et cetera, like that. And normally like plants in the ocean absorb uh, some of these gases like carbon dioxide is like the the major one. But the issue is. Uh, these gases are now acting like a blanket over our planet. So as the sun rays come in, normally they're able to escape. But the blanket that comes from like emissions is keeping that heat trapped in. Therefore, our earth is warming up and causing all of these climate issues. So that's my understanding. I I don't know what you want to add and maybe correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's right. That's they they call it like the greenhouse effect. That's what I saw, too. And that's been a lot of the conversation as, you know, the if the atmosphere is, uh, I guess, cleaner, if you will, or what have you, this gas either kind of escapes or the, the heat escapes. Um, but like you said, it's kind of creating this blanket, this cloud uh, where it's keeping a lot of the heat in. And some of the reasons when I looked that up, um, you know, the greenhouse gas emissions or things that are causing this blanket to rise. Um, the number one reason, which they said 57 percent of the emissions are coming from is from carbon dioxide from uh, fossil fuel use. And I'm sure we'll talk mm-hmm. about that in a little bit. But the other aspect of it is like um, uh, destroying like forests and plant life. Like you said, things that kind of eat up that carbon dioxide, uh, we're losing um, some of that. Mm-hmm. So it's like we're emitting a lot more and then we're uh, taking away the the or- organisms that, you know, suck it up. And then now it's just causing this 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 blanket to keeping, you know, keeping us warmer than we normally should be. And that has a lot of other effects. You know, what's funny uh, because this is, has been like a really weird and funny debate among people uh, because there are like three greenhouse or the three most common type, these are not the only greenhouse gases, but the three most common type are like carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. But the the methane um, usually comes from livestock and other agricultural practices. Um, And there was like this really weird and funny debate over like the role of what they call cow farts, which I actually learned that cows don't fart, they belch. <laughs> um, so that's something that I learned from this. <laughs> but they emit methane. And, you know, that will later get into like how, you know, meat and livestock like factor into that. But I, I thought that was interesting. And the, the nitrous oxide, um, that's like emitted during like agricultural and industrial activities, but it doesn't make up as much like carbon dioxide is the primary one, but mm-hmm. there are other gases that are emitted um, based on our activities uh, that contribute to this greenhouse effect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, looking at some of the data too, I think this is what's been alarming a lot of the scientists. Um, it's just the evidence of how, Annually, over, you know, since the early 1900s till now, we've been seeing this dramatic increase really from like, ah, probably looks like around the night. I'm looking at this chart around the 1970s, 1980s until presently. It just really starts to skyrocket uh, as far as Mm -hmm. the temperatures. Um, Before that, it was pretty consistent below um, where it should be. Right. Uh, uh, When we talk about the emission of greenhouses and all that kind of stuff, gases and then uh, the global temperature. Uh, and so now it's seeing that like every year, it's just like if you look at the chart, it's just going sh- almost straight up uh, at a very rapid rate compared to what it has been historically. And I think that's what's alarming a lot of the scientists and starting to predict of where we will be in the next 50 to 100 years. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's what kind of struck me is that it is with our increases in technology and um, industry that we are destroying the planet. So as we get smarter, we are hastening our own demise. Uh, there was like a a study that looked at like 700 climate records and it showed that like for the last 2000 years, 
the only time that the uh, the climate around the world has like changed at the same time um, and in the same direction has been in the last 150 years. And we, you know, think that's the rise of the machine, the rise of the factory. Um, and, you know, that kind of led to what I saw as like some myths and misconceptions because people will be like, oh, there have been other periods in time where it got cooler or where it got warmer or, you know, it just snowed outside. What do you mean by global warming? Um, and it's about the fact that the entire planet, the entire globe is moving in the same direction at the same time, because in like the past, yeah, you might have seen different regions um, have like fluctuations in climate, but we're talking about the entire planet here. Yeah. And that's the that's the big issue. Um, you know, looking at this data it's very weird when you hear some folks, you know, sometimes on a conservative side, act like climate change <laughs> is just a myth and it's it's fake and it's not real. Um, and I think even in just my lifetime, I think we see the changes, uh, especially when I look at hurricane season um, and then see how, one, how massive these hurricanes are. But then usually when you look at it, you just see how they start to develop and like back to back to back to back. When I look mm -hmm. at those weather maps, I'm like, yo, this is this is pretty wild right now. It's pretty extreme. And I can't really remember times like that. Yes, we've had terrible hurricanes in the past, but it's just like even when we had Hurricane Sandy up here in the Northeast, um, it, it was like super rare for hurricanes especially in the New York, New Jersey area, to make it up this far. Uh, by the time they would get up here, it's cool. It was usually traditionally cooler, um, more land, and they're usually weaker, where it's just kind of just like a bad windstorm, tropical storm, et cetera, but never like massive hurricanes. And when Sandy hit, did a lot of damage to the New York area. One, because we just rarely ever have hurricanes hit us like that. And I think we're going to start seeing more and more like that because hurricanes can survive longer because of the change in climates and temperature. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the things that I saw is like, you know, all of our weather events will become more severe. And like you said, hurricanes, they're more intense. They are now moving uh, at a slower pace and they are taking longer to die down. So I think we'll start seeing like hurricanes like like moving further, probably inland, I'm guessing. I, I don't know. I mean. I don't want to be like Trump and draw that little map to say like a hurricane <laughs> about to hit Alabama or something. But I mean, you know, they might be traveling further, potentially. Yeah. Yeah. I think. And I like I said, I think just seeing it from where I've been living and how I've seen, I've seen those those changes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the biggest ways that scientists are saying that climate change will affect us, will uh, dealing with and we'll talk about the more specifics in a little bit, but I think um, definitely the change in weather. But when we have these massive storms, it affects the environment. And so I think even now we see things when they hear about shortages, right? We've heard not too long ago, they were talking about like the potato shortage potentially and certain mm -hmm. things like avocados. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, not the avocados, right? Not the avocado. I mean, I, I feel that way too. No, not avocados. <laughs> and so it affects those things, but it also affects the way people, uh, certain resources when it comes to like fresh water and, and who has access to those things. Mm -hmm. you know, if it's like a heat wave and dehydration and and do you have the resources to seek a cool space and environment to to live especially for those who are elderly and things along those lines i think um it really is going to impact you know the 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 developing places which is really sad right because it's the developing nations that are causing this and the mm -hmm. and those who are not in these nations are going to be the most affected by it Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, so kind of on that topic, like the impacts of climate change and like what it is specifically doing to, you know, our world, like heat waves, uh, kind of like Ty said, um, heat waves, you know, are longer periods of time where temperatures are above normal. Um, and we are experiencing more frequent heat waves. And this is particularly important when you think of, like I said, vulnerable populations, particularly the elderly, especially if they don't have like central air um, and, you know, just other disadvantaged populations. Heck, I know in the Northeast, I don't know if this is just like a Boston thing, but like air conditioners are not a, a built in central thing. It's like people put them in the windows. That is definitely a Northeast thing. <laughs> Cal. 
Well, somebody's people going to have to end up investing in some central air like we have in the South where it's always been hot because it's like, I honestly don't know how y'all survive. Like when I, uh, when I used to live in the rest halls in Boston, uh, when the fall semester started, they always took the air conditioners out. So like I would literally be in my room dying, like with all types of fans on, just trying to stay cool, just like suffering time. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's how it is when um when we first moved back from the Midwest, you know, Kristen uh from the south from from Georgia. And so when she we moved here, we were looking for our apartments, look for all these places. She was really upset that a lot of the places that we were looking at did not have central air. And she's like, mm-hmm. what kind of place is this? You know, where, how y'all living mm-hmm. up here? And it makes sense. I think it's a lot more warmer in the South and, you know, it's just a kind of a standard thing, but in these areas, it is not the case. So I think that's, like you mentioned, it, it can be more problematic for areas that are no even have accustomed to that kind of heat um, mm-hmm. on long periods of time. Mm-hmm. Another one is uh, as temperatures warm, we actually starting to see like a migration of plants and animals to higher elevations, like away from the equator. But one issue with that is that some of, you know, some plant life or animal life may not be able to adapt to these new environments that they're having to move to because of the warming of our planet. Mm, no, that makes a lot of sense. I can see that. Um, and I can, yeah, I can see if, and, uh, more interaction between humans and wildlife probably than more so um you know stranger things happen and maybe like you know i've seen i don't know the data on this but definitely an uptick on videos where people ha- are seeing like are interacting with like bears right that mm-hmm. kind of wildlife and things like that and i think if we yeah if they're moving or if their habitats are being destroyed then it pushes them more into uh, our spaces and i think no i definitely don't want to see no bears in my backyard (laughs) yeah that's definitely been happening with like deforestation and i even think like with the rising levels like folk in florida gonna have to watch out because them gators gonna be (laughs) (laughs) you know that's something that i've been uh worried about myself you know not that it's like an immediate worry but it is like um living along the coast and where you're trying to buy property and doing things like that it's just like man will this place could be potentially underwater or be threatened by floods you know if what some of the scientists are predicting high uh rising sea levels uh because of Mm -hmm. the arctic caps melting because of the increase of global temperature you know is going to rise and so those places on the coast are going to be more effective affected than those living you know in in middle states or places off the coast Agree. And it's actually so I'll be very real. Uh, So John is from Houston and I well, I ain't gonna say I like Houston a lot. I don't like the traffic, (laughs) but I like Houston as a city. And one of the real reasons that I am very hesitant to settle there is because I'm like, I cannot restart my life every couple years that there is like a major hurricane, like just within a you know, probably the last five or so years, there have been like, I think two major ones. And it's like, depending on where you live there, like you're flooded out. Like I, you know, one of his relatives was literally out of her home for months. And I can't do that every few years you know, that because is, it's only going to get worse. That is a lot. And I, yeah, I've heard about Houston um, being pretty bad with floods and it's only going to get worse. Like we said, we already seen the one hurricane hit and because of things are warming, we know that hurricanes survive long enough and I think they'll get more. Uh, mm-hmm. Florida's built for hurricanes, right? Because I'm always just like, how do people even live in Florida just as mm-hmm. is? Because it's just <laughs> way too much. But they are like built for that. But yeah, the rising sea levels and stuff like that is a completely different story. Uh, but yeah, those are real concerns for sure. I agree. Uh, and one of the other things that's been in the news, I feel like a lot lately, is wildfires. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cali, for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, when, you know, wh- climate change also impacts wildfires, when they're not controlled, of course, they destroy homes, you know, they destroy lives. Um, and uh, the number of large wildfires in the length of wildfire season has been increasing in recent decades with climate change and global warming. Yeah, 
Yeah, even when we seen not too long ago with what happened with the Amazon rainforest, which had a lot of headlines there. And, you know, we kind of addressed why that was even happening and uh, issue with some of these wildfires. Yeah, because of the heat, more dry land, et cetera, like, especially places like Cali, um, uh, unlike, you know, uh, Amazon, which still gets a lot of rain. But Cali were usually in a lot of droughts when it comes to, you know, their water intake and stuff like that. Which is also cause or an impact of climate change drought. So, mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, so lack of water, drought, more heat fires uh it all you know is, is a cycle and it connects to one another and i think um yeah we're in some interesting times and it really has me and i know a lot of people are thinking about it too and i'm sure we could talk about this in a little bit is the future right for the next generations um is why i think a lot of folks like around our age and of course older are taking this a lot more seriously um because you do think about like your kids and your grandkids in particular uh who will what kind of world will they be living in and can we begin to slow this trend down at all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I agree. I can't think of the name now. Um, I remember I was in elementary school and I read this really cool book. Um, I'm going to find the name because I think it would be cool for kids. But it was about how, you know, this was a future time and the planet had heated up so much that people couldn't come outside of their homes without like these special suits. And I guess the government eventually had to find a new place for everyone to live. Uh, And so it's like the journey of like this young girl as she moves to this distant land and space because we have made Earth inhabitable because because of like global warming. Mm. Which at the time I didn't get, I didn't get it at the time. I was yeah. like, oh, this is just a little cool adventure. <laughs> it didn't <laughs> click. Yeah. But I thought about it as an adult and I was like, yo, that was a really cool book for an elementary school person to read. It kind of sounded like the plot to the 100, <laughs> the show The 100. Which I love the 100. I watched <laughs> yeah. that too. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's funny. But just thinking about, because I know you wanted to talk about like, you know, thinking about the impact of climate change and global warming. Um, We've talked about how it impacts these systems, wildfires, droughts. Like we talked about how it impacts the earth, Um, even mentioned like the next generation. But I know you also mentioned like how it impacts populations differently. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So this is a this is a point um, that I definitely want to cover. Uh, and even when looking at these, you know, researching it, the term that kept coming up was environmental injustice. Right. Is um, I think what many activists are using to kind of highlight how these changes, not just globally uh, with climate and stuff like that, uh, but also impact, you know, local people, local folks in this country and how it affects more than others. And we already said briefly how you know, developed lands, developed countries are probably going to uh, suffer the least compared to undeveloped countries or countries that are still developing, but also within developed countries like the U.S., we know that everything isn't equal, right? As far as environment, where you live, how you're treated, et cetera. And so naturally that is going to play out when we talk about what's going on with the environment and who will be affected within our own country. So I wanted to see how will this affect Black folks and Black communities in particular. So there's a lot of research that is being discussed about this. And so even, you know, I was telling Dev um, a little bit off air in the last debate, um, uh, they talked about climate change for a while. And a couple of the candidates didn't mention how this is also more of an issue for communities of color, why we need to address it now, why they address that. Of course, it can be debated. Um, a lot of it tried, like someone like Bernie Sanders, who tried to just use climate change as a loophole to say, like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, climate change does affect black people. Yes, it's going to affect the entire world, Bernie. We know black people will be <laughs> included in that. Uh, but there is a reality here where in our country in particular, and probably a lot of places around the world where uh, black folks are a little bit more affected. Um, So one of the biggest issues when I was looking at how uh, communities of color are more specifically, uh, uh, you know, uh, impacted by these issues of climate change and climate justice has to do with breathing in polluted air. Um, It says communities of color breathe in 40 percent more polluted air than white communities across the U.S. And this is coming from the NAACP. Uh, They have this study called cold blooded uh which is like coal as as the uh, you know what they mine is uh, you know 
play on words. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but they're talking about how fossil fuel technology is really directly the blame for a lot of this pollution. Um, a 2014 study at the University of Minnesota confirmed that people of color in the U.S. are 38 percent more likely to be exposed to asthma causes asthma causing uh, pollution like nitrogen oxide, nitrogen oxide and climate warming cars, CO2, Mm -hmm. et cetera, all this stuff. And it's because these companies will dig or use these fossil fuels and build these plants in already kind of these um, disadvantaged communities or near these disadvantaged communities. And so naturally with all that kind of pollution, we're going to see a lot of health effects, either dealing with blood pressure, of course, dealing with things like asthma and the like. You know what? It's interesting that you say that because so all my life I was a normal in terms of health. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, when I was like 17 or 18, I started developing this like really bad cough that just would not go away. It was so weird. It was also embarrassing because I would just be, you know, in class or in church and all of a sudden I just start hacking and coughing. And um I still don't know the cause. The doctor said it was probably environmental, um, but it was something called coughing asthma. And it was something that I did not develop until like 17 or 18. And they said it was environmental. Mm, Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. I mean, again, I think it plays a large role. And the idea is uh, if you're more likely, if you're living in a black community, you're more likely to be living in a polluted area. You know, and this mm-hmm. one study says, you know, although African-Americans make up 13 percent of the U.S. population, 68 percent live within 30 miles of coal power plants. Um, and so, I mean, so, again, if you're living in a majority mm-hmm. black area, 70 percent of y'all, are, the chances 70 percent of y'all are more likely living in a close proximity to one of these areas where you're having a lot of pollution, which can explain that. Um, so I think there probably is a correlation, especially the doctor said that it probably was related to the environment. It probably was. Mm-hmm. 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 Um, I guess, you know, kind of thinking about that topic, um, anything else in terms of like how it differentially impacts communities of color? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that was one way looking at, um, you know, fossil fuels and how they are, uh, you know, the plants in particular, which again is man-made uh and the fossil fuels um but you know so there's i I looked i found um a few places where we've seen uh extreme economic uh, not economic environmental injustices uh and a couple examples one was like in union hill virginia where there was a pipeline and we they talked about the pipeline before like in south dakota right or before that was like a Mm -hmm. whole big thing Mm -hmm. we see a similar issue which i don't think got as much uh publicity which was right in virginia as well uh where there was a pipeline coming through a historically black community and for the same reasons that they were fighting it and protesting what we saw when it was like in South Dakota. It was the same issues that were happening uh, with uh, this black community in Virginia, you know, the kind of causes and the pollution that it would cause by allowing this. Um, And places like Miami with uh, uh, little known as, you know, all these ethnic enclaves uh, like Little Little Haiti uh, has Mm -hmm. what they call um, climate gentrification. Uh, And this Mm. is, uh, they said it's a, a product of segregation and discriminatory zoning laws. So Little Haiti is 75% black, uh, but the neighborhood is sits at a higher ev- uh, elevation than mm-hmm. other neighbor- uh, Miami neighborhoods. So because of this scare of climate change, many uh, wealthy white people are moving up into Little Haiti and pushing them out because it's at a higher level than oh, the rest. Oh, that is so crazy. Yeah. I can see see that though but that is crazy yeah yeah it's a bit wild um and then hurricanes right the weather changes south carolina uh the gullah people there and hurricanes so uh, what they say is that a few miles off of the coast of south carolina uh, lies the sea lands which is home of a gullah community and you know they're the descendants of enslaved people um, who work for the rice plantations and all this other kind of stuff and um what they're seeing is that because of the increase 
frequency of hurricanes, um, that many of them are living in really like desperate situations, having to relocate, but don't have a lot of resources to move. Um, Mm -hmm. So some of those communities, it really looks like if you would go to like some of those, you know, images we see with stereotypical images of third world countries and things along those lines, these places are not being rebuilt, like some of the major urban centers or wherever that gets a lot of attention, but in a place like, um, uh, the, uh, the the coast off of South Carolina. I forgot what did I just say it was called. Um, no, the Sea Islands. Well, you were talking about uh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Sea Islands. Uh, they don't get a lot of publicity. Don't get a lot of resources, and they kind of just stay destroyed <laughs> without that rebuild. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you know what. Thinking about that, it reminds me of the whole New Orleans situation after Katrina, and how you know we had this major event. Well, part of it was the flooding because the levees broke. So some of it was like, okay, government not doing what they should do to, Mm -hmm. um, you know, make sure infrastructure was in place to prevent some of this flooding. But after it happened, they took so long to try to rebuild some of these communities. And guess who came in? Investors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of these people came into New Orleans and have turned these historic neighborhoods into like pretty much Airbnb neighborhoods. Like nobody even lived there anymore. It's just like, oh, let's, you know, buy these houses along parade routes and like rent them out for thousands of dollars, like during Mardi Gras. Like Mm -hmm. that's what New Mm -hmm. Orleans has turned into Mm -hmm. because of the devastation from these events. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, New Orleans is funny you mentioned that because there's another um, I can't remember it's close well it's in Louisiana and I think I heard of this one before uh, I'm not sure if it's this one St James Parish but it might be another one where again where the where the pollution was so bad oh no it is it is because they had the oil the fossil fuel development and the oil refineries and stuff like that um, were so bad that in this strip of land in Louisiana. It was literally giving people cancer in these black communities uh, because mm-hmm. the pollution was so bad. Uh, so not only do they deal with the hurricanes, but also the fossil fuel industry because of where it's located near the Gulf. It's a lot of, you know, companies that are trying to get into that business are creating a lot of pollution in these companies and are not just causing things like asthma, but are also increasing the, the rates of cancer in these particular places, which is insane. And then one last one, you know too, that- because I'll oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll let you finish that last because maybe it's related. I'll let you finish the last one. Okay. And then one last one too is like, you know, again, we understand that, you know, a lot of this, I guess, assumption is like, oh, and I just mentioned Miami, but a lot of places that feel like they're going to be hit the worst are like, oh, or uh, rural areas and rural communities. But um, we've seen, you know, this ur- what is known as urban environmental injustice in the places like South Bronx, uh, which is in New York City. Right. Um, and again, we already know that's being gentrified because I think a few episodes ago we mentioned how white folks are calling this so bro. So bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but they've uh, kind of even what you mentioned, Daph, is like uh, the polluting industries, uh Lot higher rates of asthma related deaths and hospitalizations that were happening in the South Bronx um, and uh, had a big issue with Hurricane Sandy when that came in in 2012. And again, like I said, these communities that kind of get destroyed and don't have the help, what happens? Well, these developers come in, fix it all up, you know, up now it's it's green because of the blowback of what happened to climate change. So these facilities are closed down. And then now you have uh, white folks coming into these areas and gentrifying it now because, uh, you know, the the climate and these fossil fuel companies pushed out the, the natives of the South Bronx. Um, so we're even seeing these effects in major cities like New York, too, not just everywhere in the South and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, I think it's just in, in general what I was thinking like with some of your comments is how scary it is thinking about the health implications of all of these environmental issues. So, you know, thinking about, you know, these oil pipelines and thinking about even the Gulf spill a few years ago and how, you know, although they say it's safe to eat Gulf shrimp and, you know, Gulf uh, seafood products, we actually don't know how these things are going to be affecting us over the next 10, 15, 20 years. We really don't know. We're not just killing our planet, but we're killing ourselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, 
Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a real thing to it because, yeah, it's an ecosystem and everything and everybody kind of feeds off of that. Like we eat the plant life, we eat the animal life, what have you, and whatever they're ingesting will eventually affect us. Um, not only just habitats or where they're moving and relocating to, but also whatever's happening with their, you know, disease and, and genetics uh, affects humans as well. So I think we got to think about that for sure. Mm hmm. And it was, I think, just in November, um, you know, a few years ago, activists were, you know, protesting against um, the pipeline in uh, North Dakota and how exactly what people thought was going to happen happened. And they had the big um, oil leak uh, mm-hmm. that was about three hundred and eighty three thousand gallons um and it was much worse than what they initially reported and it's just kind of like how how is that going to impact the people who are living in this area how is it going to impact the like overall ecosystem um because we think we're damaging the environment or we think we think the damage that we're doing to the environment doesn't matter, but it's all going to come back to us in some way. Yeah. And and I think the sad thing is, and this is one of the biggest issues when Trump first got elected is him like really almost shutting down the EPA um, uh, and what they do and the research that they do. And then cutting off a lot of the changes that were made in policy during Obama administration, like the Clean Air Act. And the clean power plan, which forces these corporations to make sure that they are not over polluting or at least fixing up areas or being aware of these things and holding them, putting more regulations on like these kind of fossil fuel things and giving more money to um, innovations to help people be less reliant on fossil fuels. And Trump came in and rolled back all of that stuff and at least took away those regulations where now they can increase or continue the damage that they've already been doing. Mm -hmm. I actually read an article that said that lobbyists and lobbying groups uh, spend about 200 million a year lobbying to control, delay or block uh, climate change motivated policy. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of money in politics just pushing back against it. Uh, it, BP has the highest annual expenditure on climate lobbying at 53 million, followed by Shell at 49 million, Exxon Mobil at 41 million, uh, and Chevron in total each spend around 29 million a year to block or delay climate related policy. Mm. See, see, so there's a lot of um, corporate interest in why they are doing this uh, and they're going to influence our politics. And that's the scary thing is that most people do vote with the interest of your family, of your community, of what is important to you. But corporations, when they get invested in our politics, they only worry about uh, getting profit and what's going Mm -hmm. to get revenue. And so they don't give a damn about the environment. Why? Because I feel like for them, getting money now is most important. And they feel like by the time all this stuff happens, they'll be long gone. Right. Or mm-hmm. even if it does happen, they'll have enough resources and money to protect themselves from the damage that can occur because of it. Child, they probably got all types of bunkers <laughs> yeah. set up for them. That's like luxury. Like if the planet burns down, they're going to be fine. And yeah. their generation is going to continue on. I think I saw a story I- not too long ago. Somebody creating like this bunker where he's like renting out rooms or you can buy like a room in the bunker for like a million dollars or something like that for if there's like massive mm-hmm. climate change or nuclear warfare and stuff. Yeah, it was like a bunker community in some... I don't know. It's probably in like the Dakota type area, yeah, but I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, But you know what? I think after reading this and like seeing like um when like when this all started, I was just thinking about how bad capitalism has been for our planet. <laughs> Like Mm -hmm. the rise in capitalism and the push toward making a profit or increase in profit margins at, you know, regardless of the costs, human costs, environmental costs, it's just pushing us in a direction that is kind of like scary because 
people no longer matter. It's like only money matters. And what I don't get is there's only so much freaking money you can spend in a lifetime or in three or four lifetimes if you're looking out for your children and grandchildren. So it's just like, seriously, Mm -hmm. people are hoarding money and destroying the planet. You're not even going to, well, you'll be able to enjoy it, but the people you, what, I guess, are saving it for in the future mm-hmm. won't be able to? I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's the point of generational wealth if you won't have generations to give it to, right? <laughs> it doesn't yeah. make sense. Um, yeah, I don't get it. I think, I think, but I think that is the issue with capitalism per se is it's like we don't, it's like we're just, uh, we just over consume and we just need way more than you actually Oh, we get or we reach from way more than we actually need, uh, which is the issue. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, it made me think about, so like now that we're on a topic of politics, actually talk about, you know, where people stand on, you know, different solutions to, because, you know, when I think about solutions to uh, global greenhouse emissions and et cetera, or what people call like a carbon footprint, there's, uh, I guess, societal level changes that can happen or that could potentially be regulated by government. And then there are also individual. So I thought it might be a good idea, especially since the election is coming up to talk about like, where do some people stand on uh, various solutions to um, climate change and global warming? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Here we get into okay. that. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, in terms of like the carbon footprint, a lot of it comes from like energy use at home, at work, on the go, transportation. Uh, so like, for instance, 29 percent of U-house, U.S. greenhouse emissions come from electricity. Um, and it, you have to think about like, how are we generating our energy? Like what sources are we using to provide electricity? And so. There has been talk about like whether we should move to like nuclear power because nuclear power allows you to generate energy at with virtually no greenhouse gas emissions. Mm, okay. But I feel like there's a lot of danger with that <laughs> when I just yeah. hear things about nuclear. <laughs> yeah, because the issue is one, what do you potentially do about like toxic nuclear waste and, um, you know, potentially trying to prevent major catastrophic issues, like I guess a Chernobyl or something like, you know what I'm saying? Like, how do you do that? And Mm -hmm. it's interesting because in Tennessee, we have uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA, and, you know, they provide all of our power and they have like a lot of nuclear plants and it's like, three pretty much surrounding my hometown. And I guess I just took for granted that like, yeah, like nuclear power actually provides like 45% of uh, electricity in my state. Mm. So it, it's, it's happening. And I guess I've never felt unsafe, but you know, there is issues of like what happens with like radioactive waste and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But in terms of where um, political candidates, Democratic political candidates stand on that, uh, Bernie Gabbard and I mean, I guess we could still mention her, Marion Williamson, (laughs) uh, they support that uh, closing down um, existing nuclear power reactors. Um, And it's just because um, they fear accidents like... um, Japan, uh, there was like a, uh, in 2011, um, there was a major accident that was caused by a tsunami. So yeah, tsunami caused an outage that led three reactor meltdowns and spread radioactivity through the air and the water. So you think about like, I guess if we're having these uh, weather events, how they might impact our ability to use clean energy like if some of this shut down mm-hmm. uh but uh cory booker buddha um klobuchar and yang 
all support nuclear power. Okay. And Biden supports developing new nuclear technologies as a part of an effort to fight change. So, you know, I don't know how that's different from the other ones, but okay. <laughs> like you support it, nuclear power? Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, I think the other thing, so I know in Tennessee, we have policies about like emissions. Like if your car does not pass an emissions test, you cannot get um, a new, you can't renew your tags. And so you have to um, get your car fixed and reduce the amount of emissions that you're putting in the air. Um, And so there are five candidates who support a carbon emissions tax, but this would be on like businesses. Um, And that is Biden, Buttigieg, um, Yang, and then two of the people ain't even in a race no more. But um, (laughs) uh, they would want to, they see that as an efficient way to get businesses to reduce their greenhouse emissions. Um, he's so funny. Uh, Steyer, who I'm not sure how long he's going to be in the race. Mm-hmm. He supports um, what they call a cap and trade program where the government would set a limit on the total amount of carbon that could be emitted in any given year and require business to obtain credits for every ton that they produce. I don't even know what that means. Mm-hmm. Um but okay, cool. Steyer, Steyer, whatever his name is. Um, and then Bernie and Warren are for government uh, regulations. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it sounds like Steyer is trying to speak the language of businesses and say, f- provide them a financial incentive for make, meet, meeting these regulations. So mm-hmm. if you don't hit this quota, then, you know, you can't get any tax breaks, tax credits is probably what it sounds like. Again, it just depends. You know, they're all about money. So if they're making more money than they would save by just blowing by these regulations, then it may not be enough <laughs> Yeah. of an incentive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the last major, I guess, climate change issue that people have talked about, like regulating is like oil and gas drilling. Um, so the candidates who want to end new oil and gas leases on on federal land and in offshore drilling is Biden, Booker, Buttigieg, um, Klobuchar, Steyer, and Yang. And Bernie and Warren want to ban fracking. Okay, okay. Which, what what is fracking? (laughs) I assume it has to do with the offshore oil um, drilling. Yeah, you know what? I was was reading this stuff. The process of injecting liquid at high pressure into Mm -hmm. subterranean rocks. Yeah. So. uh, It opens fissures and extract oil and gas. So I guess this is a different type. Maybe not traditional drill, drilling, but you're just injecting something in it that makes it easier to drill or get the content you're looking for. It's like hydraulic fracturing is what they use. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I think it it's kind of like that's why this conversation is important because they there's a lot of terminology. And I think that's just, this is why I've kind of been turned off by the climate mm-hmm. change debate, because it's just it's a lot of terminology. And it's like you can't read an article without like referencing like a dictionary or something like to know exactly what they're talking about or else you're just going to be making assumptions. About yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a big part of it is just uh, people got to know what you're talking about in order to get behind it or know how it affects them, uh, which I don't think they do a good a good job but they just say yo it's climate change yo global warming is getting hot mm-hmm. everybody's like okay but what else <laughs> yeah but what else yeah um but you know there are societal things that we could do i don't mm-hmm. know if you have anything to add to that but there are also things that we can do as individuals yeah one thing with the societal stuff um before we get to individuals is you know i just want to talk about how because uh, i'm sure and this has been brought up in a lot of the some of the debates, but also the larger conversation with like AOC talking about the Green New Deal, which addresses a lot mm-hmm. of this, um, the issues that we've discussed so far. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the main thing with the Green New Deal, it is really trying, the main 
proposition is to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which is the main thing. But they also, you know, have supplementary issues or tr- things they're trying to fix, like economic inequality and racial injustice. Um, but the, 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 the economic inequalities, they're just saying, like, if we create more ways to or resources to reduce emissions, it'll create a kind of green economy, which are new jobs. We can hire more people kind of situation um, is what they mm-hmm. anticipate. Uh, but Largely, the things, the main provisions with the Green New Deal is that the goal is for the U.S. to take a leading role in achieving what they call net zero emissions. Um, And net zero emissions just mean that for every um, emission of carbon dioxide, there is something that absorbs it. Right. So you're not having more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than needed. And so it's trying to reduce carbon emissions, but also increase ways that carbon dioxide carbon dioxide is absorbed, absorbed, mm. whether by planting mm-hmm. more trees and doing stuff like that, but also just mainly just getting um, uh, these major corporations to try to use like renewable sources, electricity, solar energy, what have you to power or do whatever they're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, so this is making a lot of conversation because people are saying, oh, it's going to cost a lot of money. Uh, but, you know, AOC is like, well, we need to do this if we want to save the planet. Um, but it also will save a lot of money because it'll uh, give you know lower unemployment rates and it will um, create uh, less of a burden on the health care because a lot of the issues, like we said, put a more burden on it when it comes to asthma or cancer and all this other kind of stuff um, in the long term. Uh, but Trump and them are like... <laughs> Trump is like, oh, it's going to take away your airplanes and, you know, and then other uh, Republican, um, uh, Senator John Barrasso, Republican in Wyoming says like, oh, well, if we pass this, you won't have ice cream and cheeseburgers and milkshakes anymore. Like, uh, Yeah. You know what's <laughs> but, but why language? And I think I think why that's effective, though, is because they're actually even if it may not be factual, they are relating it to people's lives, mm-hmm. right? They're equating like, oh, if this is passed, that means I can't have my cheeseburgers no more or my milkshakes or I can't ride in a plane. And I feel like progressives, people like AOC need to do a better job at saying like, yo, if we don't do this, this is what you won't have, right? This is what you can't have, how it affect you specifically. Um so I think it's just funny, just the different dynamics of how they speak about mm-hmm. it, how it resonates that with is, that, That's true. You know, messaging, they are good about messaging. I swear. I swear. They are. And they just, they break it down to the nitty gritty. <laughs> yeah. <to> just <laughs> And it'd be like these Democrats, they'd be yes. out here talking about fracking and stuff. It's like, I don't know what they, yes, child. <laughs> yeah, <we're talking> about, <laughs> about fracking and CO2 Methane. and all this stuff and trillion dollars did. <laughs> Conservatives like, listen, y'all ain't gonna have no ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> and that's enough to get you to be like, uh uh-uh, uh, I love my cheese, my ice cream. Exactly. You talking about Democrats? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's too funny. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to mention the Green New Deal because it is like a societal, like policy uh, approach to addressing these environmental issues we've been talking about. Okay, but that that does lead like into um, the discussion about like what we would do individually because if the GOP or conservative um, politicians use these like fears around how your everyday life has to change in order to make the planet better because that's what they're doing like and so I guess we it, it would be good to talk about like what would it look like for you to do a little bit every day that could help make the planet better Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you got some things you want to start? Well, okay. I was about to say the one thing, because we talked about energy, the way energy is produced and how, you know, that contributes so much um, to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But just think about it like this. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people already do this. Turn off your lights. You know, it's not only going to save you money on your electric bill, but it'll also uh, reduce emissions that come from generating electricity. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure black folk been doing that. I know, I know. That is one, like, <laughs> black folk are very green when it comes to that electricity. <laughs> you don't pay no bills around here. <laughs> uh, turn the lights off, shoot. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and they're already doing this in California because of like drought issues. But, you know, reducing your shower time, trying to conserve uh, water use because you think about, okay, you might be like water, you know, how blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, thinking about the process that it takes to heat up the water. So if you're taking like hour showers every day, you're doing a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know in Cali, they were actually having people like kind of like put water in a bucket or whatever and then like use that to like wash yourself up instead of having the shower continuously running. I'm going to just say that's a little extreme. <laughs> I, I just rather reduce the overall thing. I am not finna. They call it, I ain't gonna even, I'll say they call it a bird bath. They call it a different yeah. type, but I ain't gonna cuss. <laughs> it's, it's a bird bath. I ain't taking no damn bird bath. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Funny. I'm sorry. I can't do that. Um, This is one uh, that I want to talk about because I do. So like, if you are like me, I use a lot of productivity apps. Um, and I use one that's called Forest. Have you ever heard of it? No, I never heard of that one. Okay, so it's this app that is supposed to prevent you from like using your phone while you're supposed to be working. And in the app, you can plant fake trees like for every minute or like so for every hour I plant. Uh, so for every hour I'm in the app and not clicking on other things, um, I get so many points for planting a tree. But Mm. they actually, these are fake trees, but they actually have it to where you can actually plant real trees because we've talked about deforestation and how we're, you know, losing a lot of our green space um, because, you know, people are knocking down um, our forests and stuff like that. But with the forest app, um, it costs about 200, I mean, 2,500 um, points to plant a tree. And, you know, for me, that might take a week or two because you get probably mm, like okay. 10 to like, you could probably get like 25 points for every like hour or so, something like that. Okay. Um, so it's just kind of like, you might not be outside planting trees, but you get a productivity app, you'll be productive and you'll be planting trees to help reduce yeah. uh, carbon dioxide in the, in the no, air. No, that's cool. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. I don't know if you have any things. Yeah, there's some um, getting down yet yeah, to the individual stuff. And I think it's important because I'm sure people are like, again, I don't think many of the politicians do a good job at saying instead of these big policy oriented things, what are the little things we can do? And actually some of them are very enticing because like we said with black folks, we like to save on our energy bill. And I think some of these things will help. Um, and one thing is if you have a home is trying to think about using renewable energy. And this is something that I've thought about as well for when I purchase my first home is thinking about and doing the solar panels mm-hmm. um, because it does really offset uh, your your utility bill one um, so and it can be a hybrid I think a lot of this is misconception of folks say when they have solar panels that all of your energy has to come from it if the sun ain't shining you can't power nothing in your house <laughs> that's not really how it works it works is where you can set a certain percentage of how much of the energy you want to come from the solar power and then how much you want to come from you know your regular electrical source and then they have even where where your solar power runs out then it just goes back to your regular electricity so it's like you're actually saving a lot on your electricity bill um every month because you are now using a lot of energy off the solar panels. Mm-hmm. The only thing is that it's not cheap to install, of course, um, which would be a, a cost. But over long term, if, especially if you're buying a new home, you're going to be there for years. It will save you a lot of money on an energy bill and you'll be helping out the environment as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, another way is to uh, weatherize your homes. Right. Um, so if you have AC units or you have um Uh, essential air conditioning or you pay for heating and cooling and all that kind of stuff. Um, The government gives you tax credits for energy efficient home improvements. So, you know, if you're trying to seal doors or garage doors and windows and provide new like ceilings, all that kind of stuff that really keeps and maintains energy while keeping your house cool longer or warm longer, um, you will can one get tax incentives for that tax credit incentives, federal tax credits. And you can also, again, use less energy because now your house, your house is just insulated a bit more. Mm -hmm. Again, this stuff got to be reasonable. It's not going to be, you know, cheap to kind of 
weatherize your home, but long term savings for you personally and the environment. It's a double a double plus. Mm-hmm. Um, what else is there? Another one is a big one and is, you know, I know there's been a lot of conversations and I feel like uh, possibly because vegans need to just work a little bit more so on their marketing plan. <laughs> mm-hmm. But there is a, a huge um, benefit to uh, eating less meat. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of the experts even say it's not that we have to completely take meat out of your diet. It's just that you don't even if you say you eat meat seven days a week and you just drop that down to three days a week. Right. You're doing a, a lot to reduce the usage of meat because the reason for a lot of the forest fires we see or the reason why we see a lot of the deforestation is because they're clearing land just for simply simply for cattle to roam mm-hmm. um, so that they can eat and then we can eat beef products, et cetera. So I think we if we begin to lower our consumption of just meat products, don't have to you know, you don't got to be extreme and cutting it all the way out. It will be a lot better for the environment because there's more people. There's more consumption of meat. And they're trying to keep up with the demand and they're destroying more land just so we can eat this beef. Um, so I feel like if you treat it more as a treat beef or a steak, more of a like, you know, a, a treat. Treat, you know, yeah. You know, oh, you know, we're going out to dinner, you're going out to eat, whatever. I'll just eat it there instead of like, oh, I got to have it every week. Uh, it's doing it's damaging the environment more than helping out. Yeah, treat yourself. You know, some of the things you mentioned, because you talked about like the cost versus the savings of giving things. And it made me think of, I took this, uh, what they call a cool, cool climate calculator, which uh, is a tool where you can uh, calculate your carbon footprint. Now, there were two different ones. One was like a little bit more confusing. I'm like, or it was just, it was basic. It wasn't as cool. But Berkeley, as in the university, um, has a cool climate calculator and we'll list the link. And, you know, you go through different things to see, like, in relation to travel, home, food, shopping and stuff like that. Like um, how much you're in carbon you're emitting every year, but also where you stand in relation to like the average American. But what I really mm. liked at the end was that it provided an entire list of ways to reduce your impact but it also with for every individual way you could reduce your impact they provided an upfront cost but also total dollars saved every year um and i'm not going to list them all but i do want to list a few to where either the upfront cost is zero but you're saving money or the upfront cost is low and you're saving money so for instance Riding a bike and you'll also get healthy taking public transportation, although they say that's not an upfront cost, um, but taking public transportation over driving could save about one hundred and sixty five dollar a year uh, maintaining your vehicle because because I'm guessing it if you don't, you'll be uh, emitting more emissions that saves you about two hundred and fifty nine dollars a year. Um, getting a tankless water heater at your house is a five hundred dollar upfront cost, but you save two hundred and three dollars a year. And I'm guessing that water heater or that tankless yeah, water heater is going to last for a while. So that's a five hundred dollar mm-hmm. upfront cost, but you're saving two hundred dollars a year. Um, another one is batteries. So if you were to use rechargeable batteries, the upfront cost is about $52, but you would be saving about $626 a year. Oh, I thought that was pretty like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, you installing a low flow shower head, uh, would cost you about $30, but you would save about a hundred dollars a year. I thought that was pretty cool. Line drying mm. your clothes. Like you can, you know, you might not line dry them outside, but there you have, I can't think of these little wooden things where you can like um, lay out the clothes around the house. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know the name of it. Uh, yeah, I don't know the name. Yeah. Uh, and they said eating a low carbon diet, which is I'm pretty sure like more plant based, uh, could mm-hmm. save you $640 a year. Mm. 
Yeah, see, I mean, a lot of those ways now, you know, the one thing I kept thinking about was the shower. I was like, oh, I like my pressure on my shower. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Ty, do it for the planet. <laughs> that, 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 I'll just say that won't be high on my priority list of, of changes. <laughs> Oh, oh man, that's one thing I do not like is a low pressure shower, man. I need that thing to be coming out, but that's funny. Uh, but no, yeah. I think those are all definitely ways to save money, for sure. And you know, and save the planet. Even if you didn't think about it, it's like okay, you know, I didn't really think about that rechargeable battery thing because you know batteries are expensive as they heck. are. Heck, um, they are. so I might get some rechargeable batteries. But see, my problem is I forget to recharge them. And then I'll need some batteries. <laughs> Lord help me. Yeah. And I even like you said, with things like dryers and appliances, I mean, now there's a lot of smart appliances that are more, you know, eco friendly and uh, better on the environment. So even if you are going to purchase these things, you can at least get one that is more efficient, whether using less less electricity or emissions or what have you. Um, I think it'll help, you know everyone in the environment. So these are things I'm definitely looking into and starting doing, especially, you know, when I get a home and I have more control over a lot of that kind of stuff, those would be definitely investments that I'll be looking to make. Yeah. Um, Cause it's just, it's just the right thing to do. That's actually, you know, that was another one. So like if you get an energy, energy star refrigerator, um, I guess the cost difference would be like an extra 30 ish dollars more. I don't know how they got that figure, but it saved you $13 a year. So Oh, see? Yeah, for $30. Yeah, I mean, come on. Let's get yeah. the energy efficient ones. <laughs> yes. That works. That works. Yeah. Um, anything else? No, I, I feel like those were the big things. Again, you know, we'll include links to these things, um, especially like the carbon or carbon footprint calculator and stuff like that, because I think it's just really cool to like go through and look at the ways that you are potentially contributing to our global climate issue. Yeah, 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 for sure. So we'll, yeah, we'll provide the links and uh, y'all have a lot to check on, look on. We'll provide the resources. You can check them yourselves. Um, yeah. So yeah, kudos. You know, this was, this was definitely a topic I got to say that I was not, you know, feeling the most ready for. Um, and so I'm glad we were able to, hopefully y'all got something out of it. I'm glad we we're able to, you know, get some information together and compile it in a manner that, you guys can take something away, hopefully. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So if you haven't yet, um, go ahead and follow us on social media at BHD Podcast. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can also visit the website, blackandhighlydangerous.com, the keyboard with all our latest content. Email us, bhdpodcast at gmail.com. If you have any ideas, comments, concerns, just want to say hi, we appreciate all of that. Then go ahead and review and rate us on iTunes if you haven't done that yet. That really, really helps us out. So please take some time to go do that. And after you do that, go ahead, share us with your friends, share us with your family, and share us with your enemies. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear. If you're interested in continuing this and other conversations, visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com to subscribe to our email list, suggest topics, and participate in our discussion forums. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at BHD Podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite platform. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear.